Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Leroy Jones, and I'm an assistant professor of urology in the uh, division of uh, urology here at UT. And I'm going to uh, uh, speak today about sexual dysfunction in both uh, males and females. This is my primary uh, area of interest. Uh, sexual dysfunction is something that's really uh, uh, very common in our population. Uh, this is a study that was done uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, the Massachusetts Male Aging Study, and it, this is a community-based ba survey, basically to determine uh, the incidence of sexual dysfunction in, uh, in males. Uh, they looked at, at patients or, or males uh, age 40 to 70, uh, and what they found was 52% of these patients were, were found to have some degree of, of erectile dysfunction. And so really, one can extrapolate this to involve uh, a significant portion of our population. If you look at I in those uh, patients with uh, erectile dysfunction, uh, sexual dysfunction, and it was about 1,300 men that, were, uh, uh, that completed the survey, you can see the breakdown uh, uh, that they uh, 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 noted in, in this survey. 10% of patients noted uh, complete erectile dysfunction. 25% with moderate and 17% with uh, minimal. So certainly this is a, a, a quite a broad spectrum of men that, that did uh, complain of sexual dysfunction. This is another uh, interesting study. Uh, this study was uh, recently uh, released in the Journal of the American Medical Association that was uh, published in 1999. And this study was really the first study to look at the incidence of sexual uh, dysfunction in both men and women. And this was really the first such study to, uh, to do that. And you can see on here there's about 1,400 men that uh, completed or, or participated in this, uh, this survey and about 1,750 women that completed uh, uh, the survey. What the, uh, uh, the, the questionnaire uh, asked basically was did the patients complain or have any difficulties and experience uh, uh, poor desire? Are there any arousal difficulties, erectile dysfunction, or poor lubrication in the women? Uh, inability to achieve climax or ejaculation, if they have anxiety about sexual performance, did they climax or ejaculate too soon, was there any type of pain, or they, they did uh, not uh, find a sex pleasurable. The reason that this study is, is uh, very interesting is that it was found that sexual dysfunction was more prevalent for women, 43 percent, as opposed to, uh, to men. And this is really the first study that, again, that looked at uh, uh, both uh, sexes in, in, in the same uh, type survey. Um, they did find that it was associated with age and educational attainment. And certainly, uh, a lot of people think that uh, development of sexual dysfunction is related to uh, aging. It's really more of a para-aging phenomena, uh, meaning that there are uh, conditions that can happen as one ages that's, that can lead to sexual dysfunction. Um, they also found that different racial groups uh, reported different problems uh, when complaining of sexual dysfunction. Now, with regard to the men, which we're going to discover uh, or uh, talk about first, uh, we'll talk about the women at the end of the talk. When you break down uh, the sexual dysfunction complaints in this particular uh, survey by, um, by the men, premature ejaculation was noted in about 21 percent of uh, patients, erectile dysfunction in about 5 percent. Uh, poor desire in about 5%, and again, about 70% were not uh, affected. In my typical practice, the majority of patients that I see with uh, sexual dysfunction, or men, that is, is uh, with uh, uh, complaints of erectile dysfunction. But generally, don't see uh, uh, many patients with uh, premature ejaculation, but as you can see, as, as reported in the community, this, was, this seemed to be the bigger uh, problem. So the bottom line of the study is that sexual dysfunction is something that's uh, uh, affects a, a wide, uh, uh, or is widespread in our society, infects a, you know, a huge number of, uh, of patients. Um, and it really should be recognized as a significant uh, public health concern. Now, when one looks at uh, sexual dysfunction or development of erectile dysfunction, uh, there are certain risk factors that, that are, have been known uh, really for some time now to cause uh, sexual dysfunction. And basically, any disease that will involve a disease of the blood vessels or, or the nerves. Diabetes is such a disease, uh, hypertension, uh, elevated cholesterol, hyperlipidemia, hypogonadism, which is a uh, uh, low uh, uh, hormone level, smoking, alcohol, drug use, if there's any trauma or surgery to the, uh, uh, to the spine or to the pelvis, coronary artery disease, the CAD, and peripheral vascular disease. 
and also patients with uh, complaints of depression or stress. There's been a long association between depression and, and sexual dysfunction. Uh, the two will uh, uh, coexist oftentimes. And then finally, Peyronie's disease or, or bending of the penis. Now again, kind of getting back to this vascular etiology, you know, you know we, we talk about uh, sexual dysfunction in, in the aging and really it's more of a para-aging uh, phenomenon. If you look at men that complain of sexual dysfunction that are older than age 50, over 50% 50 of these patients will have some type of vascular problem or vascular uh, etiology. If you look at men who have had a, an, an MI, a heart attack, 64% of these, uh, of these men uh, uh, will uh, complain of some, some type of sexual dysfunction. And again, so, you know, other causes of vascular dysfunction, diabetes, smoking, smoking elevating cholesterol, obesity, uh, and, you know, all, all of these disease states can affect other blood vessels besides the heart. Now, what my uh, uh, typical evaluation uh, will uh, include in the patient uh, comes in with uh, sexual dysfunction, uh, we are now very interested in, in getting validated questionnaires. It's important because I think the patient, we, we send this material to them uh, before they see us, so the patient is uh, free to, to fill out this, uh, uh, this material at home. They can think about it. Um, they're less anxious when the physician's uh, not uh, right in front of them. And I think it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, there's, we're also interested in, in possible antigen decline, uh, particularly in the aging uh, male. And again, there, there are questionnaires for this, and if anybody's interested, you can certainly just reach me by email. I have my email up at the end of the, uh, the talk. Um, and so these are some of the questionnaires that we use to get some uh, baseline uh, uh, history uh, from the patient. In addition to these validated questionnaires, we're also interested in, in obtaining a good uh, uh, history and physical exam, uh, laboratory evaluation, and then also penile blood flow uh, studies. Now, penile blood flow studies are, are, is, is a, a technique that we use to evaluate, the, obviously, the blood flow of the penis. This isn't done in everybody, but certainly Again, getting back to this uh, relationship be between uh, development of erectile dysfunction and cardiovascular disease, uh, so it's important to know if there is uh, disease uh, uh, blood vessels in the penis because this may be a, a sign that the patient may be going on to develop uh, cardiovascular disease. The typical laboratory evaluation will include uh, testosterone, uh, free testosterone, the male hormones. It's best to obtain these levels in the morning as there is a, uh, an AM uh, surge of, uh, of these uh, hormones. A fasting glucose, if the patient has no uh, uh, concomitant history with diabetes, again, to look for other associated problems, a lipid profile, and a, a PSA, a prostate-specific antigen, if it's uh, indicated. Again, why do I do uh, this uh, more involved testing? Uh, the testing isn't really done on, on everybody. Uh, the patients I'm very interested in is the patient that comes in that has no other uh, coexisting medical problems and uh, uh, they now present with, with erectile dysfunction. And again, you know, we, we're trying to identify men that are, uh, could be at risk of developing other types of vascular disease. Um, I think uh, it will also help us in certain circumstances uh, assess the severity of the disease, try to identify the etiology and pathologies, and then so we can uh, uh, appropriately uh, treat the patient. Um, oftentimes, at least when the patients make it to us, um, they really want an, an answer as to why they're having trouble with erections as opposed to just being put on a, uh, on a pill. So I think it does meet some of their expectations. If there's some obvious reversible causes, then uh, those are, are addressed uh, initially. If there are a variety of prescription or non-prescription drugs that can cause this erectile dysfunction, we try and modify that. Certainly as a urologist working with the uh, primary care physician um, uh, to, uh, to alter their medication if possible. If there are any hormonal abnormalities, uh, uh, that can be easily uh, treated. Is there any anatomical abnormalities and are there certain lifestyle and psychosocial uh, factors that can be uh, 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 altered to, uh, to improve the uh, uh, sexual uh, dysfunction. Now the uh, first-line therapy really in today's uh, uh, environment is the uh, oral agents and the only, only uh, oral agent out there is uh, Viagra which uh, everybody has heard of. Um, there are other agents uh, kind of in the pipeline, we'll talk about that. Uh, some of the other first-line therapy uh, agents that are used, uh, one is a vacuum constriction device. This is a vacuum erection device. You may or may not be familiar with it, but um, essentially it's a cylinder that goes over the penis. 
a vacuum is created, the penis fills up with blood, and a constrictive band is placed at the base of the uh, penis. This is fairly cumbersome, and um, not too many patients are interested in, in this type of uh, therapy. And then finally, uh, sexual therapy, if indicated for uh, individuals or couples, if it's thought to be more of a psychogenic uh, uh, problem. When one looks at the oral agents that are available, uh, currently, uh, sildenafil or Viagra really is, is the, uh, uh, the first uh, uh, oral agent that has a, a great response rate. Um, Viagra came out in March of 1998, and, and really I think it, it changed the way that, that we, uh, we deal with uh, uh, men with sexual dysfunction. I mean, certainly for many years, patients would often ask if there was a pill that they can take to, uh, to help them with erections, and, and now there is. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the other uh, uh, associated problems with cardiovascular disease and uh, uh, Viagra because that, that seems to be the big uh, um, issue or question. Verdinafil is another agent that you may or may not have heard about. Uh, this is an agent that's not uh, yet released. It's similar to, uh, to uh, Viagra or sildenafil. And Verdinafil is, uh, is uh, being manufactured by, uh, by Bayer. Um, it is also a phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitor, and we're going to kind of go over uh, the pathway of, of Viagra and, and exactly how it works. So um, if you're not familiar with that term, uh, you will be a little bit later. And it's felt to be a little bit more selective than, uh, than Viagra, uh, so therefore a lower dose is uh, possibly uh, needed. But in a lot of the uh, earlier studies uh, that have been done thus far on, on, uh, on uh, Vardenafil, they didn't really look at uh, the patient population, such as uh, patients with diabetes or peripheral vascular disease, uh, spinal cord patients, MS, and so forth. So it's, it will be difficult, or it's, it's not yet known if, if the effic efficacy is the same as uh, Viagra, but nonetheless, um, there is going to be some competition for uh, Viagra that's, that's around the corner. Uh, Cialis is another uh, type of phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And then there was another medicine, apomorphine. This was a central mediator, but it really was found to have too many uh, side effects. So again, so the, the only oral agent that's currently available is uh, uh, Viagra. Uh, Viagra, I'm not really going to go over the, the, uh, the dosing too much. I mean, most of the patients, we initially uh, start with uh, 50 uh, milligrams uh, tablets. And, and basically, the way that the, uh, it's instructed for the patient to utilize this medicine is to uh, uh, take a tablet about a half hour, hour uh, before planned sexual activity. I find that the best response uh, for these patients is to take the, uh, the medicine on an empty stomach. Um, if the patient has had a particularly uh, high fat meal, um, this will influence uh, the absorption of Viagra and the patient won't get as good of a response rate to it. So um, we start them off at 50, although most of the patients ultimately will need uh, 100 milligrams. If they don't respond to the 100 milligram tablet, then they're generally not going to uh, uh, respond to, you know, 200 milligrams. And then, you know, at these higher doses is when you begin to uh, bring in some of the other uh, side effects uh, that that can be experienced. So really, 100 milligrams is is the uh, is a proper dose to begin with. I think it's reasonable. I mean, if somebody's tried Viagra a patient once or twice and doesn't get a an adequate response rate, um, I actually have a have the patient try it uh, uh, several times be, um, because uh, it certainly has been suggested that uh, some patients don't respond to it initially. There is a, a delayed type of a response, uh, but it's a very safe medicine. And again, this is the only pill that's available. So if they fail this, or they're going on to more uh, invasive, uh, aggressive uh, type treatment. So most of the patients are really quite motivated to uh, to try this medicine. As far as the mechanism of action of this uh, uh, Viagra sildenafil. Uh, nitric oxide, as, as, as you can see here, NO, uh, was identified really as, as the major uh, uh, neurotransmitter that's responsible for uh, causing erections. And so after appropriate uh, penile or sexual stimulation, uh, nitric oxide is released from uh, uh, nerve endings as well as the endothelial cells. And what it does is it works on the uh, penis, the uh, corpus cavernosum, the smooth muscle of the, uh, the penis. Um, it stimulates guanylate cyclase to ultimately form a cyclic GMP, and this is responsible for relaxation of the, uh, the blood vessels within the penis, and the f uh, penis uh, fills up with, with blood, and then the, uh, you have an erection. Uh, this PDE5 that you can see crossed out there is where uh, sildenafil works. It prevents uh, 
uh, this PDE5, so you have more cyclic GMP available. So the more of the cyclic GMP that you have available, uh, the better the er erection. So really, it, it uses the, the existing uh, uh, system in the patient and prevents the breakdown of cyclic GMP just to GMP. Um, taking the medicine in and of itself uh, doesn't cause an erection. The patient needs it to, to have the appropriate uh, uh, stimulation. Um, but again, it, it just it works with the existing uh, uh, mechanism that's intact. Now, uh, one thing that I'm often asked about is, uh, you know, is is Viagra safe in, in somebody with associated cardiovascular disease? And certainly, most uh, uh, older patients, uh, as as they get older, uh, are subject to development of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension. So they have a lot of other associated illnesses, and so you know one of the things is well, everyone I think uh, uh, has heard about uh, uh, possible risks of, of Viagra, and everyone's concerned of, about having a, an untoward uh, event in utilizing medicine, u utilizing this medicine. So there are a number of studies that have been done uh, recently and over the past uh, several years. Uh, remember, the medicine was only released in uh, March of '98. Sexual arousal and activity are associated with increases in the sympathetic nervous system activity uh, in the heart rate and blood pressure. And it, it's thought that sexual activity uh, results in a metabolic expenditure, five to six uh, metabolic equivalents of oxygen. And this is basically how much oxygen is consumed with activity. And we'll, the next slide, I, I think, uh, shows you uh, uh, some other comparable um, um, activity levels. So basically, you're gonna, the patient is going to expend five to six, five to six uh, metabolic equivalents of oxygen. In uh, older individuals, this is actually even a lower range. And those that have a, a long-standing relationship, have been married for a, a long period of time, uh, uh, use less uh, uh, energy, I guess, with, with sexual activity, uh, one of the risks of marriage. Uh, sexual activity is associated with increased uh, uh, in the relative risk for myocardial infarction or heart attack, with a very slight rise in the absolute uh, annual risk. Um, and again, as, as we alluded to before, uh, erectile dysfunction, cardiovascular disease, are diseases of blood vessels, and so the risk factors are, are uh, very similar. Now, this is a slide that looks at the uh, metabolic equivalence of oxygen consumption, and uh, you can see uh, sitting, everyone sitting in the audience listening to me, you know, they're, they don't have so much. Uh, uh, oxygen consumption, a couple of uh, a metabolic equivalents of oxygen. Me, I'm up here, I'm exerting myself a little bit, so maybe it's up to three. Uh, moderate exertion, four to six, and again, this is where sexual activity falls in. Um, walking, golfing, uh, although I know some golfers that, that get quite animated, so I'm sure they, they exert a little bit more. Uh, gardening, uh, softball, and then finally, heavy exertion, running, racquetball will consume more metabolic equivalents of uh, oxygen. So this is sort of a, a good uh, uh, way to, 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 th to think about you know, where sexual activity falls into place. And again, in older individuals, they're not going to use quite as much uh, uh, oxygen uh, consumption during sexual activity. Now, be, uh, again, with, with the development of, uh, of uh, Viagra, uh, the cardiology uh, or cardi cardiologists basically came together to uh, uh, propose an, an algorithm uh, to recommend uh, who Viagra is safe in and somebody with coexisting uh, cardiovascular disease and, and who you should be uh, quite careful about. And so uh, we're going to go over sort of what their uh, baseline recommendations are because, again, this, this seems to be the, uh, the big question. Uh, we oftentimes will s we'll see referrals and uh, uh, primary care physicians a little uncomfortable. The patient has some uh, 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 coexisting disease and putting them on Viagra, and uh, so I think this will help uh, help everybody, uh, including us, uh, uh, decide who it's uh, appropriate for and who it's not appropriate for. Again, the only contraindication for patients uh, uh, taking Viagra is, is that of patients on nitrates. Uh, if they're on nitrates, then they they cannot use uh, Viagra, but. Really, uh, in and of that, there's no other uh, contraindication as, as far as associated medicines. Briefly, want to just look at this is a New York Heart Association functional uh, classification of uh, uh, cardiac disease. So, somebody is defined as having class one if they have no limitation of uh, physical activity and they have no uh, 
heart symptoms, i.e. chest pain, anything like that, with uh, ordinary activity. Uh, class two, they have some uh, limitation of physical activity, uh, of physical activity, and, they, and ordinary activity can cause some symptoms. And then class three and class four are, are really the more unstable uh, type patients. These are patients with very limited uh, physical activity. They have uh, less than uh, ordinary activity can cause symptoms or asymptomatic at rest in class three, but in class four, they are uh, symptomatic at rest, i.e. they have uh, uh, unstable uh, angina. Um, so these are the patients really cannot do anything um, without having some type of uh, cardi cardiac uh, uh, complaints. So basically what the uh, management recommendations uh, uh, were by the uh, uh, cardiologists uh, was that they, they stratified the patients into different groups, uh, grading their, their, their risk level uh, to being uh, uh, placed on Viagra. And, and really, I, I, I correlate this to just exercise. I mean, really, that's what sexual activity is. It's exercise, as you can uh, recall from the previous slide that, that we saw. So in patients that have a, a low risk, uh, and if you look at the uh, cat category of cardiovascular disease, they're asymptomatic. They may have, they have less than three major risk factors. They have, they can have uh, hypertension, but it's controlled. They can have uh, angina, but again, it's stable. Um, or they've been revascularized. Uh, they've had an MI in the past, a heart attack, but it's been greater than six to eight weeks. They can have some valvular disease. Or they're the New York Heart Association class one. So this is the type of patient Really, there's no reason that they cannot be uh, placed on uh, Viagra if they're interested in, um, in uh, pursuing uh, sexual ac activity if they, if they do have uh, sexual dysfunction. These patients um, should be reassessed at regular intervals, you know, every 6 to 12, 12 months, but this is being done for their routine uh, uh, cardiac uh, care anyway. Um, so really nothing new. So really, it's, this is very reasonable uh, to put the patient on uh, Viagra in, in this uh, low risk uh, category. The intermediate risk group is patients they have greater than three major risk factors for coronary artery disease. They can have moderate or stable uh, angina. They've had an MI. It's been greater than two weeks, but less than uh, six weeks. Uh, they're a New York Heart Association class two, and they can have some non-cardiac sequelae of uh, atherosclerotic uh, disease, uh, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, and so forth. These are the patients that basically need to be re-stratified into the high risk or the low uh, risk group based on their assessment. So this is a patient that you're unclear of, uh, you know, what kind of cardiac disease they have. I mean, they certainly have angina, they had an MI, and you're deciding um, uh, if, if it's safe for the patient to, uh, to be placed on Viagra. So this is where the patient needs to undergo specialized tes testing, such as the exercise tolerance test or the echocardiogram. And then once this testing is uh, performed, uh, you can uh, calculate really by the exercise stress, uh, uh, stress, uh, exercise stress test how much uh, oxygen they're uh, consuming. And again, we know what the, uh, the consumption is for sexual activity, so uh, you can then determine if it's going to be safe for the patient uh, to use uh, Viagra or if they need to be re-stratified into the uh, high-risk uh, group. The high-risk group is patients with the unstable angina, uncontrolled hypertension, you know, their New York Heart Association, class three or four. They've had a recent heart attack less than uh, two weeks. Um, high risk of uh, arrhythmias, uh, moderate to severe valvular uh, disease, uh, cardiomyopathies. And again, this is a patient that needs to be under the care of the uh, cardiologist um, so they can uh, tighten up their uh, cardiovascular uh, disease. And really, uh, treatment of uh, for sexual dysfunction should be deferred in this patient uh, population until the cardiac condition has been stabilized. So I think this is a good way to, uh, to look at uh, if, if uh, a patient, if it's safe for a patient to be placed on uh, Viagra or not. So again, so low risk patients can be encouraged to initiate or resume sexual activity. They can receive first line uh, treatments. Um, intermediate risk patients uh, need to be re-stratified, so they need to undergo an, an cardiac uh, testing. And then high-risk patients, uh, there should be a delay of uh, 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 treating for their sexual dysfunction until their cardiac status has been uh, stabilized. And obviously, um, individual patients need to be managed individu individually, and these are just sort of uh, general guidelines, but again, very useful. Uh, does sexual activity uh, uh, trigger a possibility of having a heart attack? Um, it can, but the overall risk is really very small, um, and again, 
the patient participates in any type of regu regular exercise uh, program, um, then the, the risk actually decreases uh, even more. So uh, the risk is, is really very small. It was not found to be uh, that significant. What about for patients with uh, diabetes? Again, in diabetics, uh, they looked at patients with both type 1 and type 2 on diabetes. And the incidence of adverse uh, events was no higher in patients with diabetes than in patients without diabetes. Oftentimes we'll get questions, uh, you know, the patient has diabetes, they are, they are subject to a development of silent ischemia. And again, as you can see, uh, the incidence of, of problems was, was no different in these patients with diabetes or without. So uh, diabetics are certainly a reasonable uh, uh, patient population to pursue with oral therapy. Keep in mind, though, that in, in the diabetic population, only about 50% uh, of them, 45% of them will respond to uh, uh, Viagra, and this is because there's a uh, abnormality of secretion of this nitric oxide, this neurotransmitter that we had discussed uh, previously. They just, there, there are problems in them uh, producing it, because diabetes is a disease not only of the blood vessels, but of the nerves as well. So what happens if the patient fails uh, oral therapy? Well, the uh, next line or second line of therapy is injection therapy or intraurethral uh, therapy. Uh, MUSE is an intraurethral suppository where a medicine is administered, uh, oprostadil, into the uh, urethra. Uh, the medicine absor is absorbed through the uh, urethra, and what it does is it causes local uh, vasodilation or increase in blood vessels uh, within the uh, penis. Penis fills up with blood. I don't really have too many patients uh, that are on MUSE. MUSE has been around for a little while when it came out. Um, it came out before Viagra, and uh, everyone was very interested in it, but uh, uh, less so now. Uh, one study uh, showed that of patients that are given prescription of MUSE, only 25% of them refilled it, so the patients aren't that happy with it. There's a lot of urethral uh, irritation and uh, other problems from it, so I'm not a big fan of that. Um, injection therapy, prostaglandin, uh, uh, some of the medicines that are approved by the FDA, Cabrajac, Edex, these are medicines that are injected directly into the penis, and again, they cause uh, vasodilation, the penis fills up with blood, and they get an erection. Um, these are, the, the type of erection that they get is, it's a good erection, the patient, the, the dropout rate for this type of uh, treatment is high. Um, because uh, patients aren't so happy putting uh, needles in their penis every time they want to get an erection. But again, it depends on how motivated the patient is and, and uh, 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 if they fail the oral therapy, then the options are, are really quite limited. The trimix is just generally the, uh, the, uh, uh, the pharmacist is able to, to mix up a little uh, uh, combination of agents, um, again, to be injected into the penis. And these types of therapies, the prostaglandin E1 and the, tr and the trimix, are generally done uh, in the urologist's office. Each patient needs to be titrated to a specific dose. Everyone uh, uh, responds differently because it depends on their level of vascular disease uh, within the penis. So uh, the urologist is very comfortable in, in um, titrating these patients to, uh, to obtain the uh, proper uh, dose in, in them. And then finally, the third line therapy is a surgical uh, prosthesis. And yes, we still do these. Uh, not all patients, you know, if you look at the overall response rate for Viagra, it's maybe about 50 to 75 percent or so. So not everyone's going to respond to it. We talked about some of the other therapies, um, injectable therapy. And again, it just depends on how motivated the individual is. I think it's important uh, to uh, demonstrate to the patient that there are uh, uh, many different options uh, uh, for them, and, and we are, uh, uh, I think certainly one thing that Viagra has done is that it, it's put uh, this conversation about sexual dysfunction out more in the forefront, so patients are a little bit more uh, uh, willing um, to discuss uh, uh, if they have any types of sexual uh, dysfunction. And again, uh, the surgical prosthesis, the uh, patient satisfaction rate is high, the partner satisfaction rate is high. There is a risk of uh, infection, but it's really quite small. And these devices have been around for a while, um, so the device malfunction is, is getting less and less as they uh, get uh, refined. I want to talk a little bit <coughs> about testosterone replacement. Um, there's certainly a lot of interest now in testosterone, testosterone replacement, um, especially in the aging male. Uh, I just got back from the, uh, our national meeting, uh, the American Neurological Association meeting that was out in Anaheim, 
And there were a number of papers that were presented on uh, testosterone replacement, and um, uh, some very interesting stuff has come out. We certainly know that testosterone, free testosterone, is uh, felt to uh, decline uh, uh, with age. The rate at which it declines is about 100 nanograms uh, per deciliter, although there is certainly some debate um, in this, and not all people feel uh, that it will decline with age. As I said, in patients that do come in with uh, complaints of uh, sexual dysfunction, they are evaluated with uh, blood work, and, and that includes testosterone uh, levels, so you, know, you try and individualize for each particular patient. And at least uh, some of the thought is that there is an alteration in the hypothalamic pituitary uh, uh, unit in some of the uh, older patients uh, getting this, uh, this androgen deficiency. The relationship between testosterone and erections is, uh, is not quite clear, and, and that's what a lot of the papers were, uh, were trying to, uh, to find out. We certainly know that testosterone uh, plays a large ro role on libido or sex drive. Um, and that's been known uh, uh, for a while. But as far as uh, somebody having low testosterone and has poor erections, putting them on testosterone won't necessarily uh, allow that particular patient to have uh, erections. But certainly it may play a role. Uh, testosterone is thought to uh, play a role on the uh, smooth muscle um, uh, within the uh, penis. So there is some, some role, but we just don't know what it is yet. If you look at the benefits and the risks of uh, placing a patient on uh, testosterone, there certainly are a number of benefits. And again, we're not you know, putting the patient on super uh, uh, levels. We're trying to put the patient back into the normal uh, physiologic uh, uh, range um, to what it should be. And so, as you recall, initially when the patient's evaluated, a questionnaire is, is administered to the patient um, to see if they have any uh, complaints of this antigen decline in the, uh, in the aging male. Um, some of the benefits increase in muscle mass. Um, it can preserve or improve bone mass, prevent fa uh, fractures, can improve strength, can improve the overall sense of well-being, cognitive function. There is decreased vascular risk, but you can look over on the risk, and it can increase the cardiovascular risk. That's that's really unclear at this point. But again, we're not uh, we're just keeping them within the normal physiologic uh, range, and certainly it will improve uh, uh, libido and uh, I guess there probably should be a question about uh, erectile dysfunction. But some of the risks, fluid retention, development of gynecomastia, induction of polycythemia, uh, possible increased cardiovascular risk. It's thought to uh, increase the uh, uh, LDLs, and, but the lo low density lipoproteins, but again, that, that's unclear. Um, it may hasten, I think the, p the reason that people get a little bit concerned is that it can hasten the onset of clinically significant benign or malignant prostate disease, and, and, uh, and if, if, it, if the decision is made to uh, put a patient on testosterone, it really is very important to get a baseline PSA and to follow that patient you know, a little bit closer than you normally would for the first year if they're getting it uh, continually, and if they seem uh, like they're responding well to the testosterone, they want to stay on it. Um, because certainly if them, somebody does have uh, uh, prostate cancer, you, you will see the, uh, the PSA increase dramatically initially in, in that short period of time. So it's very important to follow uh, their, uh, their PSAs. And then liver toxicity, toxicity, and this is only with the alkylated testosterone. This is primarily with the oral uh, agents, which uh, not too many of us uh, use. If you look at the different preparations that are out there, uh, most commonly the injectable uh, therapies, the patients are placed on two to 400 milligrams every uh, three to four weeks. And again, you're looking for um, uh, the improvement in their overall sense of well-being, muscle mass, and so forth. Um, some of the transdermal uh, uh, applications, the patches and the gels are, are, uh, are nice. The gel, androgel, has uh, been out for, I guess, a, a little bit a year or so. Two to five grams are placed uh, daily. It's actually placed as a gel uh, on the patient at night. The patient applies it. Um, and so in the morning, uh, they get that nice peak because, again, as you recall, when you're obtaining these, uh, these blood work uh, or the blood work on these patients, it's best to get a testosterone in the morning because there is a diurnal uh, variation. And then the nadir is at night, so uh, that, that's when the androgel is applied is at night. And so by the time they wake up in the morning, they're getting that, that nice surge of uh, testosterone. So um, there are a lot of uh, uh, good preparations uh, that are out there. Certainly one of the things 
that's against the gel is the cost, uh, uh, whereas the injectable is, is uh, a lot less costly. Some of the patients can be taught to uh, administer uh, the self uh, or the medicines uh, themselves at, at home. It's contraindicated. You should never replace testosterone if somebody has pre-existing prostate cancer, again, um, which reasons that are fairly obvious, pre-existing uh, breast cancer. Now, I want to say a few words about uh, female sexual dysfunction. Um, again, this goes back to this article that we already discussed. Uh, Laumann, it was more prevalent for women, 43% than for men, associated with age and educational attainment. Uh, different racial groups had different problems that they, uh, that they noted. Uh, female sexual dysfunction is something that's uh, fairly uh, widespread. And again, it's something that we see, it's, it's a pair-aging uh, phenomena. Um, uh, so certainly it is age dependent, but we can see it in, in all uh, age uh, groups. But again, the uh, uh, female normal sexual response, uh, the clitoris, clitoral tissue, this is erectile tissue just like uh, the penis is, and so any disease of the blood vessels that can cause erectile dysfunction, um, it's obvious that it can cause a female sexual dysfunction um, as well. Uh, I think female sexual dysfunction certainly has become more uh, uh, or it's been addressed more in the urology uh, community, um, primarily because of uh, what has happened with Viagra. I think if you look at Viagra, uh, you know, then some women were tried on Viagra just to, to see. It's, it's not as easy as that, but certainly I think uh, uh, there are a lot of women that are looking for uh, uh, some uh, solution as, as well. And so it's something that's being uh, addressed more. Um, historically, there's been a, a lack of uh, research uh, on it. And primarily, we don't understand the normal physiology of the uh, uh, female sexual response. So as a result, it's hard to understand the uh, pathophysiology uh, of it. But certainly, more and more studies are being done. And again, at our uh, national meeting, I mean, there were a number of papers uh, uh, defining normal, abnormal, and so forth in the female sexual response. So I think the urologists, because of our, our uh, background in sexual uh, uh, medicine, uh, perhaps that's one of the reasons why we're uh, uh, pursuing uh, this area. Again, uh, many uh, mediators, uh, you need to have intact uh, blood vessels, uh, you need to have intact nerves. Uh, nitric oxide, the uh, primary uh, uh, component responsible for erections, has been isolated in uh, clitoral tissue in, uh, in uh, women. Um, hormonal regulators, estrogen, testosterone, DHEA, dihydroepiandosterone, we'll talk about that, and then finally psychogenic causes. So there's certainly a multifactorial component uh, that's responsible for the normal uh, sexual uh, response. I want to say uh, a few uh, things about uh, uh, hormones or androgens in women. Um, uh, we discussed it a little bit in men. Uh, certainly uh, in women, uh, we're finding that a, a large percentage of women with complaints of sexual dysfunction will have uh, low testosterone or low androgens. And it's important for libido in women as well, and again, for the overall sense of well-being. What are some of the reasons for low androgen? Uh, removal of the uh, ovaries, surgery, chemotherapy, and any type of fertility drugs, radiotherapy, patients been on oral estrogen, um, hormone replacement, the birth control pill, or aging. All of these uh, uh, conditions can cause uh, low uh, uh, testosterone in women. And it's certainly clear that women need androgens um, uh, for the same reasons that men uh, need androgens. and, and uh, if you look at the androgens that are found in women, testosterone, androstenedione, and dihydroepiandosterone, or DHEA. There have been a number of uh, very interesting studies uh, 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 with uh, androgens, but one of the problems is, is trying to define uh, what's normal in a woman. If 40% uh, of women have uh, or complaints of sexual dysfunction, when we establish our normal limits or in, in our blood assay, well, 40% of those patients are abnormal. You can never really establish a normal value. So what's being done now is, is trying to uh, uh, look at women uh, uh, to define a, a normal uh, level. And in fact, if, if we uh, see a, a patient, a female with complaints of sexual dysfunction, if they're even in the lower third of the normal range, um, we're, we're trying to treat them to get them into the upper uh, two-thirds of the uh, normal range. Now, one of the, uh, the uh, more interesting uh, androgens, DHEA, dihydroepiandosterone, is uh, being uh, uh, looked at. It, uh, it was first looked at in France 
Um, and uh, some work is being done in uh, Boston uh, now, Erwin uh, Goldstein, looking at uh, this uh, supplementation. Um, this is a testosterone producing a hormone. It's derived from cholesterol metabolism. It's made in the adrenal gland, and its breakdown products are estradiol and testosterone. So as opposed to just putting a woman on testosterone, we feel that putting her on a medicine that's a little bit higher up in the, uh, the pathway um, is likely uh, more uh, beneficial. Um, several studies, as I mentioned, have been done uh, looking at uh, uh, supplementing uh, patients with both uh, DHEA and a placebo, and what uh, we're finding is that it does improve sexual desire, although it's, it's not a rapid onset, it can take 6 to 12 months, um, and again, it does uh, improve the uh, sense of the well-being of these uh, uh, patients. So DHEA is interesting because it is an over-the-counter uh, preparation, and uh, you don't need a prescription for it. I, I would caution uh, uh, the patients really need to be monitored uh, when they're on this uh, this uh, this medicine, uh, their liver function tests and so forth. Because, again, we're we're just learning um, which uh, uh, how much to put them on and and uh, and so forth. There are risks uh, of androgens, just like there is risks in men, um, acne, hair loss, breast tenderness, weight gain. But again, we're 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 not super. Uh, 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 medicating these patients. We're just trying to return them to within normal physiologic uh, levels. Uh, certainly the pregnancy risks if somebody is uh, attempting to get pregnant because we do see younger women with uh, sexual dysfunction. <coughs> um, they shouldn't be on this medicine because it's unknown if it crosses a placenta. Potential conversion of DHEA to estrogen, but this has never really been found. Um, there, no studies have uh, found that this increases the risk of breast cancer. And so again, the patients really need to be monitored uh, quite closely. Uh, one more slide here on uh, antidepressants. Uh, relationship between depression and sexual dysfunction uh, has been uh, uh, long known. Um, there are a lot of patients that are on Zoloft and Paxil, the serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors. And unfortunately, 50 to 60% of patients that are placed on these uh, medicines can uh, complain of sexual dysfunction. And in fact, in, in men that do have premature ejaculation, we actually treat them with uh, either Zoloft or Paxil to, uh, uh, to uh, delay their ejaculation, those that have a premature ejaculation. So it is used to create sexual dysfunction. So certainly if patients are complaining of, uh, of uh, arousal, desire disorders, difficulty achieving orgasms, it's important to take a thorough history and know what medicines that they're on because uh, some of the medicines that they're on may be uh, causing uh, some of their complaints. So finally, in summer, summary, uh, sexual dysfunction, I think, needs to be recognized as a, a significant medical problem. Um, you know, our goal uh, here uh, is to uh, uh, train physicians to become more comfortable in discussing uh, sexual health. I think that's where, where it needs to begin. Um, oftentimes, patients are a, a little bit reluctant to, uh, to bring it up, so it really should just be part of the routine uh, history and physical of a patient, again, because it does influence the overall uh, well-being of the patient. Thank you.